Good afternoon and welcome to this Clark Hill with the Mizzen Group online seminar. Uh, thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Tom Lyons and I'm a financial journalist with digital business publication, The Currency. Uh, today we're going to be getting an update on fitness and probity in the context of the senior executive accountability regime and what are the implications for global financial regulation. Uh, I'm somebody who's written as a journalist about financial services for almost 20 years. And uh, during that time, I've written extensively about when fitness and probity uh, goes wrong, whether that's Ireland's once richest man, Sean Quinn, dipping his hand in the till of his own insurance company, or former Anglo banker, Sean Fitzpatrick, hiding his personal loans uh, from his auditors at, at year end, or more recently, the goings on in Wirecard, uh, which started in Germany, but has implications for Ireland. In each of these cases, uh, we've seen the impact, not just of wrongdoing by senior individuals on the organizations they work for, but also themselves. And in so doing, we've gained insights into the culture and behavior patterns that allow such occurrences to take place. Uh, in, in our seminar today, we've some great expert speakers. Our first speaker is Sam Starsteiner, who is a partner with Clark Hill. Our next is Peter Oakes, who's a strategic business consultant with Clark Hill. And our third speaker is Paul McCarthy of the Mizzen Group. Uh, the plan is for each of our speakers to give a 15 minute presentation. Then there'll be a Q&A session. And finally, Clark Hill CEO John Hearn is going to close proceedings uh, with a few words. Should anyone have any questions, uh, please feed them into the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screens. And I've also collected questions that people have submitted beforehand, and we will try and go through all of those at the end. Uh, but to just begin today, we're going to start with Sam Starsteiner, partner with Clark Hill. Uh, Sam was previously a partner with Galligan Johnson, which merged with Clark Hill in 2018 as part of its expansion into Europe. Uh, Sam is going to begin today. Thank you, Sam, for that uh, introduction. As Tom has mentioned, I'm going to be discussing the topic of fitness and probity in the context of the Central Bank of Ireland. Now, it's a broad topic, so I have a fairly ambitious and packed 12 minute or 15 minute lesson plan. Uh, the idea that I have is to try and answer some of the more basic questions that you may have regarding the FNP regime and to perhaps get you some walkaway tips on how to manage that risk, how to comply with your obligations on an ongoing basis and uh, take some practical steps to reduce overall risk uh, both to yourself personally and to your firm. Now what is fitness and probity? It's, it's hard to pin down a definition given that the definition is I think intentionally absent from the core um, um, legislation. It is, I think, and apologies in advance for the abbreviations here, a regime operated by the Central Bank of Ireland to ensure that persons in controlled functions and pre-approved controlled functions in regulated financial services providers are fit and proper. Those words are in bold for a reason. We'll come back to those shortly. The CBI has three core objectives, regulation, supervision, and enforcement. These fall within the umbrella here of uh, conduct risk which is a function of the central bank designed to protect consumers, protect the integrity of financial services markets, and of course, the broader economy. I think in the absence of a clear definition from the legislation, it is useful to give a, a series of negative definitions, if you will. So what, what is it not? Well, fitness and probity is not merely a compliance matter. Although there's obviously overlap with a compliance function within any regulated financial entity, uh, it is not merely that, and it goes more to the core of the operations. It is not a checkbox exercise. This is not your annual CPD requirements to be taken, and moved on and filed and, and forgotten about. Done properly, the fitness and probity regime should encourage working practices that are fundamentally different, should encourage uh, better than best practice uh, adherence to a level of professional standards, probity, ethics, and honest dealing that um, renders the uh, the, the persons who are re regulated by the central bank, uh, apart from others who have in the past uh, done disservice to the reputation of the financial services industry. It is not to be underestimated. The investigative powers, the sanctions uh, and, and publications that can be made by the central bank under the FNP regime uh, 
have real teeth and I think you ignore them at your peril. They are not optional. The requirements of the fitness and probity regime are, if you like, minimum entry standards to be given an authorization to, to function under this under the central bank's uh, rules. I've listed in my next slide the uh, some bedtime reading. Uh, it's a list of the relevant legislation. I'm not going to get into this now. You'll be glad to know. I'm just going to touch on some of these uh, that I've highlighted in bold. Uh, the Core Act being the 2010 Central Bank Reform Act. Uh, this was in response to the financial crash in Ireland. That was given a bit more teeth and meatier sanctions three years later. And in the meantime, you have the conduct of investigations regulations in 2012. I sincerely hope that everyone on this call never has to read those, but that if you do, that you are accompanied by your crack legal team, because that is the central bank's internal rule book for investigating regulated persons and uh, firms. So where do we look for, for guidance to adhere to this uh, nebulous set of standards? Uh, well, you look at the fitness and probity standards document issued in 2014. This was issued under section 50 of the 2010 Act, and it contains definitions and guidance and standards that focus on each relevant function and the applicable standards um, for each particular role. And again, the definition of fitness and probity is I think intentionally absent. The minimum competency code then was issued in 2017, and this is a highly detailed document. I consider it essential reading, uh, where I think appendix three of that document breaks down your obligations by each industry, by each role. And I believe that every year you would have, and you should have every, in, in compliance with your obligations, certified and attested to the fact that you are familiar with the applicable standards. So if, uh, if you've forgotten them or you need a refresher, that would be probably one of the first few documents I would read. In 2018, there were two documents issued by the Central Bank, a short guidance on uh, FMP standards, a uh, relatively accessible document, and then a, a more extensive FAQ. They, those two would be where I would start uh, if you feel in need of a refresher, that's a good starting point. So in summary, what is expected of me if I'm a, uh, in a controlled function or a pre-approved controlled function? Three core things really. I'm expected to be competent and capable. That is by reference to my uh, professional qualifications, my experience, my capability, my demonstrable skills and competence in my particular areas of supervision. Uh, and that can be acquired through training or experience. And again, this will be referable back to the minimum competency code that I just mentioned. You're also expected, and this catches some people out, to have knowledge of the business of the RFSP as a whole and your role within that. You're also expected to have a clear understanding of the regulatory and legal environment appropriate to the function that you hold. You're also expected, of course, to be able to identify and avoid any conflicts of interest. In acting honestly and ethically, of course, that means that any acts of negligence or deceit or similar will be red flags. But in assessing your worthiness for uh, being fit and proper and fulfilling a controlled function, the central bank will have rec uh, reference not just to your record with the CBI, but also to the financial services ombudsman or even your other professional bodies to whom you, you may owe obligations. So if you've been subject to a fitness to practice committee investigation or complaints uh, to your professional body, that will all be on the table. Essentially, the central bank is judging your character, your fitness, your probity to uh, have the authorization. Your prior employment history will be relevant. If you've lied about your prior employment history in your application to the central bank, uh, it's not going to go well for you, funnily enough. If you've been disqualified or restricted from acting as a director under the Companies Act 2014, that will be a relevant fact. Of course, it's public knowledge in any event. Of course, any convictions of relevant offences will be assessed and any lack of candour or lack of cooperation with the CDI will be noted and will count against you. You are required to also to be financially sound. This requires you to demonstrate financial prudence. Uh, and that means that if you have any judgments registered against you, if you've been rendered a bankrupt, whether discharged or not, these will all be assessed by the bank, the central bank. And if you've been a director of an entity, the subject of any form of insolvency, and that can be a successful examinership, this will still be relevant. And I've had cause to act for people in the past who, even though they had resigned from a particular entity more than two years prior to that company going south, this was still fair game for the central bank. So 
it is as broad as you can imagine in terms of the assessment that they will make of you. And a common thread throughout all of this is that all information from you to the central bank is candid, truthful, full, fair and accurate, and not in any way misleading. The guidance is relatively black and white, but as any set of principles-based rules uh, it, it tends to be, and I'm thinking here of GDPR, the requirement is that you adhere to the letter and spirit of the standards. Uh, GDPR, of course, was designed through being somewhat vague and being principles-based to change the mindset. And I think this is what, uh, this is the objective of, of the standards. In a dear CEO letter in 2019, these are the practice notes essentially that are issued by the central bank. There was a stark reminder of the obligation of firms, even in respect of individuals under sections 21 and 23 of the act. The CBI considers regulated firms to be the first line of defense, the gatekeeper, particularly for controlled function roles where prior written authorization has, doesn't have to be sought. Uh, the obligations of the firms extend to extensive internal and ongoing due diligence. And that ongoing element has been emphasized time and time again, particularly over the last two years. Uh, the flow of information from firms to the CBI is uh, critical to the ability of the CBI to conduct its functions. So they require firms to report frauds. Uh, they've given examples where firms that are regulated have dismissed employees for fraud and then failed to actually report that fraud to the central bank. Again, that's going to lead to sanctions uh, for sure. Uh, the FNP re regime applies to CFs and PCFs even when those functions are carried on outside of the state. I think that's particularly relevant with, with Brexit and a lot of passporting happening. And then the CBI expects at least one CF or PCF uh, for each firm. So what are the relevant powers? Sections 24 to 46 of the 2010 Act, really the, the bulk of that legislation, spell these out in, in a fair bit of detail. The essential role of the central bank as gatekeeper, as I've mentioned, is to control uh, authorizations. Uh, so they can suspend them, they can prohibit people from even holding any such roles in the future or for a specified period. They hold the keys to the club, okay? So the investigative powers then are quite extensive. They, the CBI can compel production of documents, can compel the, your attendance at interviews, and can conduct on-site inspections. This extends to dawn raids uh, with the benefit of a district court warrant. So these powers are similar to the CCPC, the Revenue Commissioners, CAB. It's a broad and really meaty set of powers that they are not afraid to use. Uh, of course, the administrative sanctions procedure is going to flow whenever there is a failing under FNP, and this is where you have fines being levied and publications being made. And all of this interaction between the, uh, the FNP regime and the administrative sanction procedure is going to be broadened and simultaneously refocused with the uh, senior executive accountability regime, which is coming down the tracks, and my colleague Peter Oakes will be speaking to that momentarily. What's the worst that can happen? Well, we've spoken about the power of the central bank to uh, refuse an application, for example, for uh, a CFP role. They can also suspend or revoke such, authorization, such authorizations. You can be subject to a caution or a reprimand, which will be on your record. And then in terms of fines, you're looking at up to 1 million euros for individuals or up to 10 million euros or 10% of turnover, if higher. Uh, the CBI then have expanded their policy of publishing these outcomes, and they now do so in quite a bit of detail. Uh, for example, if you look on the uh, CBI website, the most recent such publication was July 2020, and that was a 10 years prohibition from having any involvement uh, in a regulated entity. Uh, and this was as a result of giving misleading answers, failing to cooperate with investigations. I've given some other examples there. They're all available on the website. One finding that was obviously not on the CBI website is from the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. Uh, this is the case of Angela Burns, which went all the way to the UK Supreme Court and back. This related to a non-disclosure of a conflict of interest. Uh, the individual concerned was thereafter banned from acting as a non-executive director for any RFSP, and she was also issued with a £20,000 fine. I think the interesting point here is that, uh, given the number of people who would sit on financial uh, companies' boards in a non-executive capacity and think that they are therefore not on the hook, you're wrong, and this exact same approach will be taken by the CBI. So what are the walkaway tips? How do I protect myself and my firm uh, within the FNP regime? 
I think the first thing is, is that good old guidance of know thyself. Uh, first of all, you have to know what are the applicable functions uh, that the CBI would in assessing your firm or your, your work, uh, I think are captured by those roles. So identify the roles, have a look at the CBI. There's a list of over 50 pre-approved controlled functions. They're constantly expanding those. Uh, as recently as last month, uh, the CBI have issued a new PCF or designated a new PCF uh, for chief information officers. And I think it's important to note in this capacity that particularly for four, uh, smaller firms where there may not be a single, ent a single person fulfilling that role, if there are a couple of people fulfilling that function, they are all going to be captured by this. So get familiar with those roles, assess your own firm, see who should be captured, see who should be compliant here. Take proactive steps, engage in regular and relevant training. I think one of the most difficult things to form, uh, or one of the most difficult things to do is to form a habit, but that's exactly what this requires. It involves a change of mindset. It also involves, from a practical point of view, and speaking as a lawyer here, you have to document your processes because if there is ever a shortfalling or simply an investigation or uh, any queries raised by the CBI, you want to be able to show all the good stuff you're doing, okay? So take a look at your employment contracts, for example. If to aid your internal ongoing due diligence, you need employees to have an obligation to tell you if there's a judgment awarded against them, then include that term. It doesn't mean that they'll necessarily comply, but it puts you in a better position and shows the central bank that you are taking those proactive steps. So I think make it a part of the DNA of the firm. This is gonna be relevant to um, Paul's discussion on culture and behavior, but it is in, in its essence, uh, a requirement to evolve your mindset. Uh, thank you for your time and for your attention. I'll hand over to Peter. Uh, just before we bring in Peter, uh, you know, just to introduce him, uh, I first came across Peter when he was director of enforcement on financial crime in the Central Bank of Ireland. Uh, that was between the years 2010 and 2013, which was probably the most interesting and colorful period for financial crime in Irish business history. Uh, Peter is a strategic business consultant with Clark Hill, and he also sits on lots of different boards, including Transformate, AWM, Wealth Advisors, and FinTech Ireland. Peter is going to talk about the Senior Executive Accountability Regime. Uh, over to you, Peter. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, you're very kind. Actually, we met each other well before I joined the Central Bank. Uh, but yeah, they were very interesting times. And just listening there to Sam's excellent presentation, um, I was heavily involved in drafting um, the fitness and probity and also the new administrative sanctions procedure. Um, I think Sam very eloquently went through a very difficult piece of legislation in terms of black letter law. Um, and I might just sort of uh, not dumb it down so much, but we often uh, cite that movie, A Few Good Men, where um, Jack Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth which is not the greatest line in that movie. I think the best line is when um, Cruz, as uh, Lieutenant uh, Cathy says, it doesn't matter what I know, only what I can prove. And I think that's really could have been the topic for today's presentation. So if you can just jump to the next slide now, I'd like to talk about the um, financial services executive accountability. Um, one thing we have, uh, what I put it here, I put out, point out here is that Ireland is not unique in this area. Australia has a bear, a banking executive accountability regime. The United Kingdom, as many of us on the call will know, has a senior manager and certification regime. In Hong Kong, there is a manager in charge regime supplemented by a management accountability initiative. In Singapore, guidelines on individual accountability and conduct. Those tuning in, from Canada, we'll also appreciate there are similar rules there. And um, without trying to look at all of the USA, I would simply point out that there's a similar type of regime under Rule 504 promulgated by the New York Department of Financial Services. So, Senior Executive Accountability Regime, somebody in Ireland has a sense of humour, calling it SEER, like one SEER's a stake, I guess. But this is our regime. Um, and as of yet, it has not been put into legislation, but our Minister for Finance, Pascal Donoghue, and the Central Bank have been talking about this uh, in great detail. If we could just jump to the next slide, please. Um, and I could talk about what's actually in the package of measures. 
So the senior accountability regime isn't replacing the fitness and probity regime. It's an enhancement. And in fact, it's a package of measures. So the first of the four, some people break this down into five, but I think there's four. We're going to have five clear and enforceable conduct standards to apply to all staff in all regulated firms. In the UK, the regime doesn't apply to every regulated firm. There are certain sectors that are outside. In Ireland, the intention is it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you'll be subject to the CM. The senior accountability regime is, in fact, part of this package of measures, and it's going to ensure, uh, you know, the whole lot clearer responsibility and accountability. And those of you that follow this area quite closely will be very familiar that the vice chair of the European Central Bank also signalled at the start of October plans to implement stricter and more intrusive fitness and probity measures across Europe. Number three in the package is further enhancements to the area that Sam touched on, current fitness and probity regime. And then also a unified enforcement process. And this harks back even to the days when I was at the central bank. There were different ways you would deal with different supervisory issues and enforcement issues, depending upon what industry the person came from. And before 2010, we didn't have this concept of fitness and probity either. Having a look at the next slide, I'm going to talk about what the uh, Irish proposal is. If we could just jump there to the next slide, please. Okay, so if you think about this, and the way people often explain the SEER is by using this triangle or this pyramid. Now, rather than trying to make this an Irish looking document, I'm going to just copy and paste from the jurisdiction which is currently doing this because you'll be able to see the analogies and the common themes. So there are three key parts to the regime that Ireland it will look at as one of many jurisdictions in implementing its own SEER. Just to point out that when we created the central bank, the new one in 2010, the Irish government and Patrick Honahan and Matthew Elderfield, the then governor and deputy governor of financial regulation, went, went around the world, so to speak, and looked at different international regimes. So Ireland will probably benefit from getting um, some good experience from other regulators. And you can be sure as, as night follows day right now, they're in those discussions, learning the pitfalls and the benefits of implementing these things. So, of course, at the very top, the SMR, accountability and responsibility, right? The buck stops with the board. A number of us are involved as directors, chairman of regulated companies. So we're at the top, the fish what from the head, we're on the hook. Um, in the UK, there's a certification regime. We sort of have something like that now anyway, under complying and certifying compliance with the standards. But under the new model, there'll be greater apportionment of responsibility. In the old days, for the central bank to take an action against an individual, they had to show a contravention occasioned by the company. And therefore, without one, they claimed that they were limited in taking an action against the individual, and this it fell under fitness and probity. SEER is going to, to turn this on its head. And of course, as already discussed, there'll be conduct rules which will be aimed at people at the board, people at the senior executive level, and people um, and everybody that are working inside the organisation. Now, if I just jump to the next slide, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, which is a UK transition from what's called the APR to the SMR. And the reason I just wanted to put this slide up is because this is what we'll be going through as well. In the United Kingdom, there's an approved person regime. There's also what's called, a um, in Ireland, we have our pre-approval control functions and control functions. So we're going to be migrating just like the UK did across now to a new regime, but there will still be elements of the existing regime in place. So where you see SM and CR, think about that as being SEER in Ireland. And uh, I'll just jump off this slide because I don't want that slide to confuse people with the way it's going to necessarily work in Ireland, particularly our international um, uh, delegates. But that's just to give you an example of where it's um, happened in the past and how that transition arose. Now, as I said, it doesn't matter what you know, or as Daniel Caffey said, it only matters what you can prove. Sam touched on this as well. There have been examples in the past of where enforcement actions and fines have been imposed for lapses in implementation 
of fitness and probity regime. These aren't cases where individuals were sanctioned. And the reason I just wanted to mention them is because this will be the same way, most likely, the central bank will start to uh, deploy assertive supervision and indeed enforcement. So we had occasions of a stockbroking firm, a credit union firm, and an asset management firm being fined for failing to implement the policies, procedures, and the framework in order to get the fitness and probity regime implemented in their organisation. And then it's all the separate stuff that Sam was talking about, about making sure you continue to do this. Otherwise, you get hit with the stick. If we jump to the next slide, um, what I thought it would be worth pointing out here is that those failures, as I mentioned, um, the cumulative failures by all three firms could be summarised as follows. And if you think about the SEER, in the same way with the implementation of fitness and probity, it was all about the adequate systems or procedures to comply, not taking reasonable steps to satisfy the company and the board that the people complied with the then standards. You know, if failing to ensure employees performing an important role, we're doing so and we're fit for purpose, and taking reasonable steps to carry out the relevant due diligence. And ensuring that you know certain employees and also outsourced internal audit services provided uh, and com uh, providers complied with requirements. So you could replace fitness and probity in this slide with SEER, and this would be a good idea of why we should start focusing on uh, implementing this regime as soon as possible at, at institutions. Jumping to the next slide, um, lessons from history. Very briefly, in the last couple of minutes, I have. So, yes, there is a likelihood of the central bank adopting the same approach. And as Sam mentioned, training and implementation, my suggestion would be the areas to focus upon is going to be identification of persons and functions likely to fall under the new regime. I was working in London at the time the SMR came in. Fortunately for me, although I was the chief risk officer and on the board, I was on the board of a payments company that was owned by a bank. All my bank colleagues were going through the SMR and I was sitting back under a different regime. Um, but yet we participated in this exercise to map and apportion responsibility. It was taking the large institutions up to a year and a half, if not longer. And in fact, a number of people in the United Kingdom left financial services when SEER was announced because they didn't want the additional responsibility. So my point here is that if you look at what um, we need to do is take those reasonable steps to ensure we implement it. And if you look at the second to last bullet point, think about the roles that might expose your firm uh, to financial, uh, to consumer or regulatory risk, and are your staff fit for the role? So again, all about reasonable steps. If I jump to the next slide, please. Um, this is around personal accountability. And I'll just stop on this slide for a minute or two. Sam very eloquently went through and discussed a number of matters in relation to personal accountability. And uh, Sam and I worked on a matter where the person had not had anything alleged against the individual, but we were working on something where the central bank was trying to keep the person from taking up a role at a new institution. Uh, so this is like a gatekeeper role. There's no laws and there's no rules written in that area. It's a fascinating exercise to go through, having been part of the architecture of it, and to see how it was implemented. The thing I'd point out is that personal accountability, both now and the future, isn't limited to our conduct in financial services. In fact, just on the 5th of November, the FCA banned three individuals from working in financial services following finding that they are not fit and proper, their character. Each of them had been convicted of serious but non-financial indictable offences. And when you look at the fitness and probity IQ form we complete, those questions about conduct and criminal conduct aren't limited to financial services. So bear in mind what you do in your private life can impact your regulated life. If we just jump to the next slide, um, I spoke this morning at a Women in Finance uh, Summit um, and we were talking about gender equality, diversity, getting more women on the board. Uh, a point came up about technology and regulation is technology neutral. Regulation is also gender neutral. 
But what we've been discovering is that group think, if you go back to misjudging risks written by Patrick Honahan, our former governor, Watson and Regling report, is that lack of diversity at senior management and board level is a leading indicator, the central bank says, of heightened behaviour and culture risks, another reason for SEER. The culture defines the soft rules that people play by, and this is in the Mizan uh, white paper. Um, and if you excuse me, that was my own alarm telling me I have to finish uh, talking. So I'm on the uh, right, uh, the right page here. Um, but what I'd say is that there are more tangible rules as well, and this is where regulators and supervisors come in. So expect to see more. I'll stop there. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, now, finally, this morning, we have Paul McCarthy, who uh, is co-founder of the Mizzen Group and also its CTO. Uh, he's an expert in using data to effectively manage risk and improve decision making. And uh, Paul is going to speak about uh, conduct, culture and, and behavior. Over to you, Paul. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Tom, for the introduction. Um, I suppose just a little bit of background. We got interested in culture um, back in 2013 when we were involved as an independent monitor uh, on behalf of DFS New York for an enforcement action against a large international global bank. A lot of the, the kind of the findings and, and, and exhibits from that use case formed the basis of DSS, DFS 504, which you know Sam and, and, and Peter had referred to earlier, which was kind of one of the early kind of um, adaptations in terms of net testation um, around a kind of senior officer within an organization. Um, uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. And I suppose that, that formed the basis for a lot of our research in relation to understanding culture. And ultimately, you know, you, you, you talk about control functions, you talk about procedures and policies, but ultimately understanding its effectiveness becomes a critical, culture becomes that critical element in ensuring it becomes the clue to, to combine that together. So, you know, my goal today as a part of this presentation is to provide you our perspective and understanding of culture, how we believe it can be defined, measured, and ultimately that, then use that as a way of minimizing risk for you and your organization. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I think, you know, the first thing to start is when we talk about everyone has their own perspective of culture. So what is culture? You know, it's such an abstract term it's hard to describe. If you think about it generally, it's the way we, we think of and do things, whether that's at home, school, office. Culture is defined in terms of how things are done. The common definitions includes, you know, the characteristics and knowledge of a particular group of people. But in a work environment, it's more like the social glue that binds people. You observe how you behave, how people behave and interact. So you want to be like them. Slowly, a few of you ought to act the same way so you can belong and be accepted. And since each organization is unique in terms of its culture, that way of thinking, behaving, and doing becomes the so-called correct way. And we're often asked whether there is such a thing as a right culture. Well, you know, not really. There's no, you know, we fully acknowledge there's no one size fits all. Um, and there's no sort of culture. So, you know, and this is a big, forms a big part of our research and we're, we're going to show you today. And I think, you know, there's also the realization that, you know, regulators have, while well, they've been focused on it for the last number of years, um, and would possibly say that, you know, um, they've, you know, they've clearly even in, in kind of enforcement actions or whatever, have referred to culture. They haven't actually given them any direction as to what they expect in terms of the organization being able to address it or remediate or action it. But I think we're seeing those things changing in terms of their expectations. Um, and you know the the full the full expectation that they have is is talking about the kind of letter and the spirit of the law as opposed to explicitly understanding. Next slide, please. So, in our study, you know we examined the norms of of, of business in different countries. Uh, you know we're not talking about multi multiculturalism here. It's about business relationships and the way of doing things. There's a lot of similarity and also subtle differences in business cultures. Um, China, the art of Guanxi is at the heart of business. You know, family ties are very important, as is the community and underlying and its trust. In the Middle East, relationships that matter. You know, the brother of my friend is my brother, so I trust him and I'll do business with him. The Anglo-Irish model was built on maritime culture where my word is my bond. You know, let's shake in it. 
um, a handshake equates to a verbal agreement or a, a gentleman's agreement. Um, in the US, we inherited the Anglo model, but because the United States was determined to kind of shake off its colonial roots, uh, business norms be became more prescriptive and heavily focused on rules and regulations. Um, and as a newly independent and growing country, it wanted to make its position clear by documenting everything. But I think the key element we're trying to highlight, all of these things link back to trust. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about, you know, cultures within cultures, we, you know, culture is this amorphous term and it's hard to pin down an acceptable and universal definition because there are many cultures. And this slide, what we were trying to kind of highlight for you is that um, we want to, you know, to focus on things. So to understand the specific cultures that exist within cultures and within the financial sector. You know, that the way we do things here could refer to a banking culture or financial culture and how bankers behave in their capacity as industry professionals. However, unlike financial or banking culture, which affects individuals as part of the industry, the cultures within subcultures, risk culture, conduct culture, and compliance culture speak to the cultures that exist within the financial institutions that are of specific regulatory concern. And, then, and they speak to cultures that exist within financial institutions and are of uh, specific concerns to regulators. So it's really, you know, peeling back the onion and really focusing on those elements that are regulatory concern. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So, you know, we, we put a stake in the ground in taking research, common usage, and in our understanding of the financial sector defined culture as the complex set of values, beliefs, and assumptions that characterize the way an institution conducts its business. We further created tools that we refer to as diagnostics that measure compliance, conduct, and risk cultures. So, you know, if you look through the different regulatory concerns in terms of the recognition and the adoption of, of laws and policies, conduct is really how institutions and their employees comport themselves in relation to their business activities. And risk culture, the identification, evaluation, and prioritization of financial risks. All of these um, have different characteristics that need to be probed on in order to measure the understanding, the underlying risk that can occur and exist. So if you go to the next slide, please. So, you know, and this is against the backdrop of what we call is referred to commonly as the trust paradox. So um, how often do we continue to place trust in those who are not worthy of it? Um, you know, we, we, all, we, we can refer to common indicators such as the IPAS or World Value Survey that can highlight that in the financial services industry in general, there's a low level of consumer trust. Um, you know, and then you have the regulators whose job is in role is really to kind of, you know, protect markets and consumers to trust but verify. And, you know, I'm sure all of you are aware and sit in those roles where the relationship with a, with a regulator takes so long to develop and maintain, but yet can be taken away so quickly with some misdeeds or, or, or mis, uh, mis decisions by individuals within an organization. And then ultimately, I think, we struggle personally with the misplacement of trust because our own biases, our motivations may cause us to ignore the obvious. So, you know, we talk about trustworthiness. So we want to trust those who are worthy of it, but continuously struggle to be able to decipher what that actually means, right? So it's, you think of the, the Madoff and the, the well-known examples here in the US, um, you know, Madoff had bullied auditors and he had bullied regulators for years to so be, the, the signs were there, but yet, you know, people were, were ignoring those facts because they were making money. Their own self biases actually dictated how they actually viewed the information. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So how do we address it? Um, and, and really what, what we, we try to address is we, we look at in terms of, um, we talked about the placing of trust intelligently, identifying those who are worthy of trust, but what are the actually clear indicators of that? So we, we talked about, you know, we talk about honesty. Do you perceive the individual to be honest in their commitment to the objective? Competence. Do they have the skills necessary to fulfill the objectives? In the absence of, in reliability, in the absence of clear direction, will they attempt to do the right thing and not take shortcuts, right? So, you know, the goal really is, is leveraging those capabilities and building trust with your regulator. And, and what, you know, what, what is needed is ultimately the actions of your organization or the of your employees reflect your organization. 
So are your, are your employees confident enough to make good decisions? Are they supported by a culture to be honest, reliable, and competent? And is that demonstrated by consistency and alignment within the organization? And how, how, how is that done? So the techniques that, again, have been the thought leaders by central banks, such as the Dutch Central Bank, has been using perception-based surveys to really understand the alignment and consistency of the organization. So if we go to the next slide, please. So, you know, why measure culture? Um, I think we're constantly seeing regulatory expectations increasing. You know, Sam referred to earlier, this is not a tech back exercise. I think we're seeing that in all, the CBI, for example, last year issued an RFI where they're actually putting together their own supervisory framework as it relates to culture. So the expectations in relation to organizations is going to continue to increase. Um, it's, it's, it's critical to understand the views of employees because often the behavior becomes a predicate to the actual action occurring, right? So it's the, the actual perception of people is a predictor and can actually become a predictor or, or, or an influencer on in the actual outcome and it can be a leading indicator. Um, so when we look at values, we look at leadership, we look at resources, we look at respect, collaboration, we want to really probe on those elements. Um, and we want to go into the embedding factors. So again, it's really critical to understand kind of the, the effectiveness. We know you, Sam and Peter refer to training, we refer to control functions. But the reality is even with those functions in, in place, how effective are they? And this is where the perceptions of the organization become critical. Um, and it's really about performing a deep dive in being able to understand those root causes and being a, as opposed to just merely dealing with the symptoms. So, you know, and it really comes back to, if you can't ultimately measure it, you can't manage it, okay? So if you go to the next slide, please. So we have spent the last like five years on, on a research journey with our collaboration with different academic institutions and really understanding what this means. You know, everyone talks to us about what does actually a good culture mean? Well, a good culture is representative of what actually the desired good outcomes are. So we use, We've, we, in a part of our research, we've looked at in things that have been applied in different industry, in the health and safety industry, called the Bradley curve, which ultimately has proven out that uh, your, your, your culture is based on the relative strength of your outcomes. So the relative strength of your culture, so the more teams become interdependent, the more positive outcomes that you have. And really that's been based on utilizing behavioral science, theory, economics, philosophy, and, and different elements that we've, we've brought together in, in our thought. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. So all of that culminates into how, how we ultimately try to measure. So what we try to do is we take a combination of per perceptions based um, indicators from an organization and then um, align that with key metrics within an organization. So metrics that would be indicative of a good outcome or a negative outcome within that particular compliant, that, that program. And then what you can do is the perceptions become a leading and, and predictive indicator of future risks that you can have. So, so ultimately what we're trying to do here is not is, is give you actionable information. It's not about giving you a scorecard that clearly identifies that you have a good or poor culture. This is actually ident predicates that indicate underlying weaknesses potentially in your processes that could be a leading indicator of future risk. So, um, you know, again, the goal is to provide actionable information. And I think, you know, it was interesting, as I said, going back to the, the research and some of the things we were seeing, um, and it, it was, in, you know, a note from Derville Rowland back in 2019, when she was talking about, you know, 66 applications for senior positions being withdrawn um, following challenge by the central bank. Again, is that an indicator of kind of a negative outcome? And, and does that, instead of actually looking at it through the remits, was the person qualified? does it reflect poorly on the actual culture of the organization that was kind of presenting those people in the first place? So it's, it's all about looking at these things through the lens of what actually becomes a good or a negative outcome in, in trying to achieve your objective. And then backing into that in terms of the, the actual underlying controls and, and, and the effectiveness of the controls that you're trying to put in place. So with that, and over we're coming up against time, so I'll hand it back to you, Tom. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. And I'd like to invite, uh, Sam and Peter are also into this conversation now as, as we've got some time to, to put a, a few questions to all three of you. Uh, just one of the first questions that's come from one of the participants is, say, say this is a scenario where I hold a controlled 
function and have received a notice that the Central Bank of Ireland is opening an investigation. Uh, what are the first steps I should be taking? Uh, I might put that question over to, to, to you, Sam. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, look, it's a good question. It's something we, we come up against. Um, I think the first thing to do is before, if you like, putting the shields up and adopting an approach that this is now a, a litigation matter. I mean, that's most of what I do is, is litigation. Um, I, I think the first thing to recognize is that this is the first step in an investigation. The central bank hold all the power. If you pull up the walls and stop uh, any sense of engagement or um, responsiveness, it's not going to go as well for you. Uh, and I think it's, it's then key to get the right advice on board, uh, start talking to the right people, um, talk to lawyers, talk to financial experts, but craft an answer carefully because we've seen the kind of consequences that can flow if you get it wrong. And, you know, we all know that the world has changed over the last nine months. Uh, and I, I might ask this question to you, Paul, you know, just in terms of like what implications has COVID-19 had on all of this with everyone working at home and isolated from, you know, their normal work culture environment? Have you, have you, yeah, is there, no, how has that changed things? No, it's, 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 it's a great question. I, I think, you know, we, we, again, what we've observed, again, we're working with our clients over the last number of, of you know, let's say nine months, I think there, there's always been an inherent basis that processes have, have been influenced by relationship and, and direct contact with individuals. So there's, there's almost been these inherent vulnerabilities and weaknesses that have always existed, but they haven't actually been exposed because of the nature of people just working in proximity. I think the fact that no people are working remotely, um, those things are being further exposed, which reinforces the need and desire for employee engagement and really having the, the, the capabilities to understand and probe on a consistent basis um, your cultural elements and, and understanding how people are engaged and because those vulnerabilities will only get further exasperated and I think um, these are these are things that organizations have to be very sensitive to. And Peter just looking at the SEER regime uh, how do you see it? Do you see this more or less burdensome on management versus, say, similar central bank requirements elsewhere? Like, how do you, how do you think that our Ireland's regime compares? Uh, look, um, in, in terms of the amount of rules and regulation, we, we've probably actually gone past that debate now because in Ireland, look, the position simply is if the EU passes a law or a regulation a directive, we implement it into Ireland. So we get everything from the ECB, sorry, the, uh, the European Commission. And in addition, we're entitled to set some of our own rules and laws. Um, I mean, if you look at what's happening with SEER, it's not a million miles away from what the ECB is now saying, that they want to see standard fitness and probity requirements across all of the EU. Ireland could be seen to be, you know, slightly ahead of the curve there. Um, at the end of the day, um, you, work in a you work in a regulated environment, there's just going to be more rules and more regulations. I, I think the increase globally, well, at least in the US I was looking at, meant that, 80, uh, that US banks spent 85% more time man hours in quarter three 2019 than they did quarter three 2018 implementing new rules and regulations. Um, but Ireland um, obviously is steeped in a history of bank failure. And also, in fairness, central bank and financial regulator failure. Uh, so we've got to be seen to be doing it wider than white because we we are a small open economy, a small open economy. And if we aren't seen to be in the top quartile, uh, I think we we make a rod for our own back. I think the challenge is going to be for some of these international banks that have branches here in Ireland, and they're from a jurisdiction where. Uh, you know, the, these requirements may not be there. Um, anyone from the UK is going to be familiar somewhat with it. So I think it's going to be a question of or a point of sucking up and dealing with it. Um, but most importantly is planning, 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 and more importantly, planning ahead, right? Um, but, you know, we're not an outlier when it comes to regulation or, or uh, indeed um, the way our regulator looks at risk. So I'll stop there because I think there might be a follow-up question when I looked at something that came up in the Q&As. Yeah, this is the question in relation to, you know, like how does this compare with, with, with other jurisdictions, Peter? 
So the one, there was somebody who put a question in about uh, the dear chair letter that went out to the fund management companies. Did you um, see that? Yeah, the central bank's dear chair, 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 dear chair letter to fund management companies in October. Uh, the central bank appears to be taking a view that directors serving on boards for longer than five or ten years may not necessarily have the independence uh, to continue to serve as independent non-executive directors. Is this being viewed as an extension of the F&P regime beyond the codified guidance highlighted today? That's the question. Yeah, I, I think that whoever asked that question, that's a great spot in that very uh, uh, detailed letter the central bank sent out in October. Um, what the letter actually says, uh, um, and it could be the signalling, as uh, as the uh, the person who asked the question has pointed out, the review found that two thirds of fund management companies have at least one independent non-executive director with a tenure greater than five years. And 28% of those companies have at least one INED with a tenure greater than 10 years. We know under corporate governance code, generally speaking, once you get above nine years, the, the presumption of independence is rebuttable. It's interesting that they just noted a statistic at five years, but didn't say anything else. But to the, to the person's question and the point, it's no different than the central bank raising questions on diversity. And for example, later in that letter, they say that across 1,700 directorships, um, sorry, of 1,700 directorships across those companies, only 266 or 16% of director roles are held by women. So you, what we're seeing now is regulators uh, getting involved and, and trying to drive policy. Matthew Elderfield, when he was in charge of the central bank, once said, if we can't trust the commercial institutions to make a good commercial decision, we'll supplement it with, supplement it with our regulatory decision. So I think to the, to the person's question is that, look, well done for noting it. Um, I don't know whether five years is being chosen arbitrarily. I just think it's a point that's being made that somewhere between five to ten years need to start thinking about it. And look, it's a little bit like rugby. It's oh, well, not like rugby. You're not supposed to come in from the side, but regulators do. So um, that one's still to play for, Sam and Tom. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, just another question, guys, which has is, is come in. Uh, you know, what are my responsibilities as? a regulated financial services supplier if I've outsourced a particular control function? Yeah, I might take that, Tom, uh, if you like. Um, there is provision uh, for the outsourcing of controlled functions um, and, and the responsibility will pass to that outsourced supplier as long as they're regulated and as long as they're compliant with, with the regime. The only saver is that you have to have a written agreement in place. And I think JP Morgan actually uh, fell afoul of this recently when they had outsourced some of their control functions to their sister company in the US, but hadn't got it properly documented. And so despite the, or perhaps because of the proximity of the, uh, or the, the contractual proximity, if you like, uh, of that outsourced entity, uh, they, they fell afoul of the regime for, for just fall, falling on that particular point. And I, I'm just conscious of the time, but I, I think we've time for one more question. Uh, just, you know, many organizations leverage their HR departments to incorporate compliance and conduct related elements into their annual performance surveys. Is that sufficient or, or what else could they, could they think about doing? Yeah, I, I, I might take that one, Tom. Um, Again, I think a core part of our research, I mean, I, I, rein, I, I reinforced the note here about trust being the core element of, of what we're ultimately measuring. I mean, again, research has proven from our perspective that um, HR surveys have, has been the common technique being used. Um, however, the context in which the information has been obtained from individuals is under a different remit. It's based on the performance of the individual and ultimately the manager. And the information being collected um, doesn't actually meet the actual uh, merit of the actual requirements. So again, the question you're trying to ask yourself here is how do you actually measure the performance of the organization against this particular, as opposed to the individual, to give that leading indicator. And this is where a lot of these challenges will fall down and where we believe that as organizations get under cl close, closer scrutiny in relation to the mechanisms they have in place, some of these things will f f face a lot more further scrutiny. Um, so 
Yeah, but could I just could I add to what Paul just said very quickly? Um, in relation to that question, obviously the HR department and compliance, uh, you know, being involved in incorporating compliance and culture-related elements for annual performance surveys, for one thing, is great. But that's the arm which may be responsible for executing the task inside the organisation. Don't forget about the governing body of the organisation that has to make decisions based upon uh, that information, right, which is your board and the senior management team. So, um, you know, I think as people start uh, planning for SEER, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there wondering what are the first steps we, ha we have to do. And I think that point there about what you have in the HR department already is very important. In the absence of being absolutely certain we're going to have a new certification regime like the UK has, as opposed to a senior executive regime, I think it starts, pay, pays dividends now to start building out your Excel spreadsheet, start putting the different phases of planning for this, apportioning responsibility, uh, building that out and looking across the Irish Sea to how some of the UK companies implemented this over the last two to three years. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, Paul and Sam. Uh, to close proceedings, I'd like to invite John Hearn, the Chief Executive of Clark Hill, to say a few words. Uh, John took over the business when he was just 41 in 2002, and he's grown the firm to be a firm with 650 lawyers with offices right across the United States, Mexico and Ireland. Uh, over to you, John, to say, say a few words. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, thank you very much. We thought that uh, our firm's story might have a few lessons in it that could be useful to you, um, which we wanted to share with you uh, in the effort to make um, our, our lessons learned helpful. Our firm's in its 130th year this year, but our story begins in 2002. At the time, our firm was about 80 lawyers. We had three offices, downtown Detroit, a suburb of Detroit in the state capital of Michigan, Lansing. Um, at the time, at that time, with 80 lawyers, um, our competitors were two times, three times, and even four times larger than we were. And what we found was that our revenue was shrinking, our profitability was dropping, our ability to attract and retain talent had declined substantially, and um, things were not looking great. But to cap it all off, in April of 2002, our CEO at the time committed suicide. What a wake-up call that was for us. It caused us to pause um, and think about our journey, our destiny, where do we wanna go from there? We wrestled with the question for over a year and we finally decided that we wanted to grow and compete and get back in the game. What was the biggest concern that we faced? The biggest concern that we had at the time and we have even to this day is that growth would result in the loss of our soul. Um, we didn't want to lose our soul. And in fact, it was really important to us that not only did we maintain and adhere to our core values, we wanted to enhance them. And so we began a journey from 80 lawyers uh, to now 650, as Tom just mentioned, from three offices to over 25, including an office in Dublin. Um, and um, the focus on culture, the focus on core values has been central to that journey. It is the without which not uh, um, in terms of uh, qualifications uh, that we examine every time we add a human being to our organization. It's critically important to us. We think that Peter Drucker had it right when he said, um, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. Now we have over 17 business units from immigration to um, uh, banking and finance, corporate M&A, litigation, labor and employment and things. How do we create an environment where the customer experience is the same? How do we create an environment where the marketplace, the customer, the clients experience our firm with a level of culture and core values that are critical to us and create a one firm firm experience to our clients? That's the key for us. And that lesson is something we wanted to pass along to you. Sam, over to you. Thank you, John, and thank you for so graciously accepting my, my invitation to join us today. It's great to have you on board. Uh, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists, uh, Paul McCarthy and Peter Oakes, for contributing so, so meaningfully uh, to this discussion today. Um, it's, uh, it's been a great discussion, and I think uh, hopefully quite a few takeaways for uh, all of those who have attended.
Tom, I'd like to particularly thank you for so ably sharing proceedings and, and um, seeing everything and uh, for more detail on, on Tom's publication. And of course, uh, John's background, there's a wonderful article today in The Currency, uh, which is Tom's publication uh, with, with a detailed profile on John. Um, for anyone who's interested, you'll be sent a link uh, following this webinar, including links to the video, to the slides, and there will also be uh, the ability to uh, send back any feedback you may have. So we would very much appreciate uh, taking a, a minute or two just to send that back to us. Um, obviously, if there's any, you know, any questions you didn't get to ask during this, uh, by all means, send it along with that link and we'll get back to you directly. Um, thank you all for your time and your attention this afternoon. It's been great having you on board. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.